Hello everyone, this is Tim, and this is going to be part three of my Rule Master Game Master Law Review. Nice little artwork on the cover there. And I talked a little bit about the player zodiacs in the last video, and just some general terms that are used in the book that, like I said before, I've never really seen or encountered in any other GM supplement. This is probably, as I said before, one of my favorite RPG books I've ever read. It's very moving, inspirational, and every time I read it, I get something new from it. There's a section called, Why Are You GMing? Four Aspects of the Core of Every GM. And they list them as socializing, you know, hanging out with your friends, being in control of the game and setting, having a way or a creative outlet, you know, your creativity, and simply entertainment. Entertainment for yourself, entertainment for your friends, and those four elements they talk about a little bit more in depth. Talks about uh, if you're energetic and excited about the setting, about the game, that that is sort of infectious, that that will be picked up by your players, they'll latch onto that energy and bring their own energy to the table. You know, sort of what you give them is what they give back. The next section asks, why are your players playing the game? And some of the suggestions, you know, they were talking about here, um, it's basically, you know, running a game is pretty much like the cheapest vacation possible. It's sort of a mental vacation. That's the way I always think of, think of it. So it's a cheap vacation. Uh, you can have just four or six hours, or if you run any longer sessions, just time away from your daily troubles, daily life, a little bit of that escapism. You know, maybe your life isn't that bad, so that really isn't why you like to, you know, role play. But it's a suggestion. Being able to express themselves. But there are many reasons why someone will want to play an RPG, and we've talked a little bit about those in the past, so I won't dwell on them too much. Talks a little bit about group problems, how to get through problem situations with different personalities, uh, people having different roles within the group itself. Talks about the number of players, you know, what's comfortable for you, what's comfortable for your style. Maybe different genres are more able to accept more players than others. You know, it suggests three to six players, you know, maybe up to eight if it's more like a rules light RPG. So this is about giving out story rewards for things that happen in, in game and not just things that you get per level, you know. Not really what you have on your character sheet, but what happens as a re result of your choices, your consequences for those choices. Uh, you know, those could be good or bad consequences. Talks about non-system house rules, things that actually happen at the table, things like etiquette, showing up, calling off. You know, if you're going to be late, you know, let the GM know. Thinks about bringing food. You know, what is? Does everyone bring their own food? Is it like a thing where everyone brings a little bit and throws on the table and everyone can have at it. So just some different suggestions, uh, things about dice rolls, if they roll on the floor, do those count? And it just gives you a lot to think about when you're going to be running your own campaign, things you should probably think about before you start. But some of these things could be implemented afterwards if you talk to your players and they agree that, yeah, you know, we really should do it this way, we've been kind of messing things up. As far as the food goes, you know, I've been in groups where everyone throws in for pizza, Sometimes people don't have money, though, so that can be an issue. Maybe someone has to pay for another person to eat. So these are all things to think about, and depending on what your group is like, just try to come up with the, you know, the best possible way to get together, have fun, and just enjoy yourself. Uh, things like, uh, you know, are you allowed to smoke? Uh, is drinking allowed? You know, how about noise levels? You know, is, is maybe maybe your significant other is in the next room, so you don't want your players to be really loud. So these are all things, and it goes into more detail about things that aren't game-related, but are more, you know, having people over at your house related. I noticed when I went through this book that I worry a lot less about the story, you know, in quotes, than, than this book does. This seems like it's more... I would, I would liken the way this book describes things more to how Woodward, uh, Wood, W-A-D, uh, W-W-A-D, sorry, Wood, sorry, Andrew, um, would do things where he would plan things out in depth, uh, lots of lots of details, and that was just one of the approaches that this book took. 
where you talk about story and climax in the story, uh, revelation, those sorts of things. And I find when I run things, I do more improv, more at, you know, fly by the seat of my pants. I rely more on player decisions and consequences of those decisions to write the story. So for me, the story and plot isn't something that I make up. Sure, I might have elements of that, but for me, the story happens at the table and not from my notebooks. So that was the one thing I did notice about these, but it's still very valuable. Even, even with my style being different, I get to see another style and the benefits of that style. Where if you have more prep work, you don't have to fly by the seat of your pants as much, and you can concentrate on other things like listening to your players, listening to what they have to say, uh, being able to pay more attention to what's going on instead of always worrying in your head or you know the wheels and gears are always turning about what's going to happen next. Um, let's see here. Talk about the pace of the game, how you can slow it down or increase the pace to keep the game moving or to emphasize mood. Lots of suggestions. Talks about inspiration and sort of the nature of it where inspiration is sort of just a burst of creativity. That's the way they describe it. And I I found that when I have a lot of sleep, if I've uh, you know eaten a big big breakfast, you know, I'm, I'm well nourished, I'm well hydrated, you know, I have have enough to drink. Really if I just make sure that I'm as healthy as I can be, that inspiration seems to flow faster. Also there are different different ways to inspire yourself, you know, movies and so forth. And there are, you know, several ones that were listed in here as well. Uh, music, basically the, the video that Wynn did about different forms of inspiration and like Brady was talking about art and, you know, all those outside of gaming things that can inspire you to be, you know, your best, give your best presentation while you're at the table. Um, I've also noticed that the more that I improv at the table, the better and easier it gets for me. When I first started, there would be more sessions where I would look back and think, you know, I really didn't make up a lot of cool things on the fly. More so they were kind of, I don't know, disjointed and didn't really fit together well. But these days, I think I really do take the best parts of what's going on at the table and fit them all together, and the story goes off in a different direction than you know I would have expected it to. But it turns out very well. So. With inspiration and imagination, in my mind, it's sort of like you know, like a muscle. The more you exercise it, the more you use it, the better off you are. I don't know if you, you know, in your brain actually, you know, there's there's different neurons that <laughs> fire up for different parts of you know your imagination or whatever. But it seems to me that you know those uh, those brain pathways are you know more like a super highway for me now than that old deer path that they used to be. Um. This line I thought was important. What you don't know must be invented. I'm talking about setting, you know, sessions or adventures. And what you already know can be embellished. Basically just saying, you know, feel free to add on to things, uh, think things up. You can either think things up beforehand or at the table or both, you know, at the same time. Talking about taking notes, uh, rereading old material or listening to audio recordings if you've done that. You can get, you can Basically, ask your players to take notes for you if you think you can do that, if you think they're responsible enough. Because if you're like a high improv GM like me, while you're coming up with all this stuff, you don't always write things down, or maybe you're not as organized. So that's that's important to do. Um, if your current players weren't around for past campaigns, feel free to regurgitate and recycle information. I thought this was a very good point. I've had multiple gaming groups in the past, and I've run lots of games, so while I'm sitting at the table, I can use all of that past experience and just reuse it right in the game. You know, they're going to do something that reminds me of a similar situation from a past campaign. Hey, you know, who's to say that that uh, that information that I'm giving them isn't brand new? You know, they have no idea. They weren't in the the past campaign, so I do that a lot. I reuse a lot of information, plots from movies, plots from books. Uh, I think I usually read more than a lot of my players do, so I'm fairly sure that they haven't seen that information as well. If you are stuck without any inspiration, you're really coming up against a wall. 
ask for the help of other GMs or you know, DMs, whatever you want to call them. And I think YouTube is a very good means to do that. You put up your situation, your problems that you're having, and you can get lots of feedback. I love getting comments. I I love answering people's questions that they have, and I try to answer them all as best as I can. Sometimes I don't have an answer, and those can be entertaining as well. Let's see. There's other elements about you know how to motivate and manipulate players to fit the story, but like I said, that is, it really isn't my sort of way of doing things. But again, it doesn't say that couldn't be someone else's way. It talks about music, maybe you know trying to have more instrumental and soundtrack you know, songs in the background so that it doesn't interfere with what's role playing at the table. But again, if you put the, the volume on low enough, I think it can be in the background and have no problem. Watch and steal from other GMs. If you're a player in another game, watch to see what they do. How do they get around problems and interesting situations that the players throw at them? Take all of that experience and use it to your own benefit. You know, watch these YouTube videos and take our experiences and learn from them. Again, you don't have to take everything because there's different styles and different ways of doing things and you have to fit everything towards your group. But watch, listen, learn, and apply it to your own GMing style. And again, GMing is one of those things where I think you can constantly make it better, you can constantly improve, and you know, see how things go from there. And get player feedback. That can be inspiration in and of itself. Okay, I'll see you in the next video where we will talk more about this. And I'll try to speed things along a little bit. We'll see. There's a lot of a lot of cool and detailed information about GMing in this book.